Before we jump into the message, I want to let you know that the Mega Mission team, as Steve prayed, they're back safe and sound. But uh, also, continue praying. Don't stop praying for our mission team, because this afternoon, we send the team down into San Antonio. It's our Mission SA group, and uh, they'll begin their work. They'll be there all week long, coming back Thursday evening, and can certainly use their, your prayers for protection and blessing and help and for the Holy Spirit to go ahead of them to work in the hearts of the people that they serve right here, our neighbors right here in San Antonio. You know, this series is called Going Through the Emotions. And we started out by talking about the emotion of awe and praise. Last week we talked about thanksgiving and gratitude. And today we're going to move on and talk about something that's sort of a, a big change. Before we get to that, though, you know that when it comes to our emotions, there are all kinds of schools of thought. We've been raised in lots of different ways and taught lots of different methods of dealing with our emotions. So, for example, sometimes we're taught to suppress our emotions, right? To not let it show, not let it out, not show our cards, so to speak. You know, that creates a kind of a stoic attitude where, where we try not to let anyone see us emotional or being emotional. Other times we're taught that, that we're to obsess on our emotions. In fact, we're taught that we're victims of our emotion, that our emotions, we can't control them. Whatever we feel is what we have to do or say or think. That's not right. Neither one of those ways are right. Emotions are part of the way that God has created us, and so when it comes to our emotion, we need to learn to express those emotions, but to do it in healthy ways to examine them and recognize them for what they are, and then to express those emotions in appropriate and healthy ways. Today we're going to talk about a really tender subject, because the emotion we're going to deal with is the emotion of guilt. Now, I don't have to ask you if you, you know, how many people have experienced guilt. I know how many of us have experienced guilt, and it's each and every one of us. All of us have fallen short. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have hurt people's feelings or done things that are wrong. And so all of us know the reality of guilt. But we've got to dig in a little deeper because guilt is powerful. And I know sometimes we joke about it, right? I came across a Woody Allen quote this week. When we played softball, I'd steal second base, feel guilty, and go back. Well, that's fine, but the reality is that guilt is a lot deeper than that. I was thinking about years ago when my, when my boys were little. It was even before Katie was born. And we were living in Mount Prospect, and we had some neighbors over playing at the house in the backyard. Julie was gone somewhere, and so the, the dad and the mom, Dave and Katie, were at the house, and the boys were playing, having fun. All of a sudden, one of the kids, I don't even remember which one, one of them came running up. They had a, a, a wound and so they showed me the wound, and they wanted a Band-Aid. And as I looked at the wound, there was no blood. There was no cut. There wasn't even a red mark. And so as I'm looking at this, I, I say logically to my child, you don't need a Band-Aid. I don't see anything wrong. To which this lady, this mom, who was a dear friend, chimed in, and she said, but Daddy, sometimes Band-Aids are for wounds you can't see. She pulled out a Band-Aid. I forgot what she had in her pocket. It was Superman or Batman or, you know, Spider-Man or something. And she put the Band-Aid on that, that make-believe wound, and all was well. You know, sometimes you and I have wounds that nobody can see. Guilt is like that. We can look for all the world like everything is great. We can look happy. We can laugh and smile. We can have a wonderful home, wonderful family, and we can be racked by guilt. Sometimes when guilt isn't dealt with in a healthy way, it takes a terrible toll. You know, one of the stories from the mission team that, that was there, and by the way, they said that this was the best mission trip ever, which we've had lots of mission trips, and these kids that have been on it, many of them have been on many, many trips, but they came back raving, and some of the seasoned veterans said, this is the best one ever. I, I really hope you'll plan to be a part of their report on August 7th. But one of the stories they told is the story of a, of a man, he's older, they really don't know how old he is. Could be 70, could be in his late 50s. He's lived a hard, hard life. He is battered and worn and broken physically. But the interesting thing about this, this older gentleman 
is that in his early years, in high school, he was an absolute standout football star. In fact, he went on to college for a full-ride scholarship, and after his first year playing college football, he was so successful, he was drafted into the NFL. He went to training camp, and when he got off the bus at training camp, someone that he didn't know and had never met before walked up to him and said, you know, you may have some extra expenses. This will help. And he shoved something in his pocket. It was $70,000. $70,000 to this young man who'd grown up in poverty, and $70,000 all of those years ago, it was a fortune. And the reality is that that young man never went to his second day of training camp. He took off with the money, lived large like the story of the prodigal son, had everything he wanted, did everything he wanted, had wine, women, and song. And when the money ran out, his life was an absolute disaster. In fact, he ended up going back to Oklahoma City in complete shame. And even to this day, he's homeless. And I can't help but wonder if it isn't guilt and shame for squandering his talent and squandering his opportunity and squandering a small fortune and disappointing the people that he loved, disappointing the people who believed in him, disappointing the people who had coached him and raised him up and leaving his entire life a shambles instead of recovering from that and dealing with that guilt in a healthy way. Now here's the incredible thing. That's not just a singular story. We all know stories of people whose lives have been devastated by guilt and shame. So today as we, as we move through this discussion as we talk about Psalm 51, David's psalm of repentance. I want to talk with you. I want us to be focused on two things. Number one, how God deals with our guilt and shame. And number two, how we deal with our guilt and shame. So let's get the background, right? We're going to take a look at Psalm 51. And and boy, I've got to also say to you, if you have time at all, whether it's today at 11 o'clock or whether it's to podcast later on, Pastor Zach is dealing with the same Psalm 51 in ABC. He's going deeper than I've got time to, to dig into it. You will be blessed if you understand this incredible psalm and what's happening, the dynamic between David and God, because it's the same dynamic between you and me and our God. So Psalm 51 is set in this context. It's the familiar story of King David. You know that King David was a powerful king. King David was a, one of the better kings of Israel, but the reality is that at this one particular time, instead of being out with his troops at war, David stayed home while his troops went to battle. And on this particular evening, David was up on the top of his house, up on his roof, looking down on the houses around. Now, this also happened to be at the same time that the women of the community would bathe on their own roofs, out of the view of everyone else except for the king. You know that David spots Bathsheba, sees that she's beautiful, and he lusts after her, and he sends for her, and she's brought to him. They have an illicit, adulterous relationship, and Bathsheba conceives a child. Now David, David is ashamed of what he's done, and he wants to do something about it, but what he wants to do is cover it up, right? How many remember this story? So David sends word to the front lines. He calls for Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to come back and give a report to the king. And so Uriah comes back and David responds to his report and he says to him, as reward for your faithful service, I want you to go home and I want you to enjoy the comforts of your home and your wife. But Uriah is a man of honor and he will not do it. He goes to his home, but instead of, instead of going to bed with his wife, instead of being in his home and all of those comforts that he loves, he thinks of his troops who are still out fighting battles. And so he sleeps on the doorway of his home. David realizes that there's no way that this is going to cover up this pregnancy. And so David sends Uriah back to the front lines with a note. And the note is David's instructions to the other leaders in the battle that when the battle is raging fiercest, that everyone is to pull back and leave Uriah there to be killed by his enemies. 
See, David couldn't bury his sin, so now he covers it up with a worse sin, covers it up with murder. And you know, it looks like all is well. Looks like nobody's going to know the difference until the prophet Nathan comes to confront David. And he calls him out. And he tells him that God knows his sin. And in that moment, you can tell that the guilt has been eroding. It's been eating away at David's heart and his soul because Psalm 51 is David's heartfelt expression of his grief and his shame and his guilt. We pick up in Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. David is crying out to God. He's saying, blot it out, erase it, God. But that, that last sentence is so powerful. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Have you ever had that gnawing, terrible feeling? You've done something wrong. You've committed a sin. You've wronged someone. You've betrayed someone. You've done something at work. And you've got that terrible, guilty feeling. It's just eating away inside of you. No matter what you do, you can't escape from it. Sort of reminds me back in the days growing up on my grandparents' farm. You know, when you're, when you're on the farm, at least on our farm, there's always a problem with flies, right? My grandmother had two methods of dealing with the flies. She hated them. She had a fly swatter, and she was, without question, the fastest gun in the West. She was a wizard with a fly swatter. In fact, she was so good with the fly swatter, when I would get myself in trouble, usually I end up being switched with the fly swatter. But the other method that she used were these uh, fly paper strips. Do you know what I'm talking about, the sticky strips? And the interesting thing about it is they were very effective. If a fly that was attracted to that strip landed on there or even flew too close, it would be stuck to it. But you also have to know, how many remember these strips? These are treacherous things. Because the reality is if, if it was my job to go out and put up the strips, you know, somewhere to catch the flies, if you weren't paying attention, if you flinched, if you happened to look away from what you were doing and you didn't do it exactly right, you'd end up with that flypaper stuck to one of your fingers. Then the only option you had was to pull it off, but when you pulled it off, you had it stuck to this finger. And before long, you had it stuck everywhere. There was nothing to do. And if you weren't careful, you'd end up making the wrong move and getting it stuck in your hair. This was miserable to deal with. There's no way to get away from it. Do you understand? That's what David is describing. I know my transgression. My guilt and my shame is constantly in front of me. There is nowhere I can go to escape it. I want to stop for just a minute and circle back to something I said a moment ago. I know the truth that every one of us has guilt. Every one of us has shame over, over some aspect in our life or some pattern of behavior in our lives. And so today, if we, if we listen, if we focus on David's interaction with God, I think you and I can come to an understanding that will set us free. The guilt that you and I carry, the guilt we feel does not have to consume our lives. And so the goal is, how does God deal with this? How does God look at our guilt? David says in, very, in the very first verse of the psalm, your unfailing love, accord, pardon me, your unfailing according to your unfailing love and according to your great compassion. That's how he's asking God to deal with him. He's saying, God, instead of dealing with me in judgment, instead of allowing me to continue to simmer in this incredible pain, deal with me according to your unfailing love and your great compassion. So how does unfailing love work? What's it look like? Well, number one, when God deals with us out of his unfailing love, he deals with us with discipline. Now, I know we don't like the word discipline, right? 
Because discipline is the same thing that keeps us from eating things that we want to eat. It, it's the thing that makes us exercise when we don't want to exercise. It's the thing that punishes us when we don't feel like being punished. But the reality is discipline is vitally important. In Hebrews 12, verse 6, the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. My goodness, we know that's true, don't we? We know that, that when it comes to kids, if we love our kids, we will discipline them. If we care for them, we will establish boundaries. If we, if we love and cherish them, we will allow them to experience as consequences for their mistakes. We also know that, that parents who don't care, parents who let their kids do whatever they want, that those are the parents who are struggling to love their child. Dear friends, if you and I can understand as parents who are sinful and broken that loving our kids involves disciplining our children, then we can understand that our Heavenly Father knows far more about it. Our God loves us enough to allow us to experience consequences. Our God loves us enough to discipline us and refine us. In Psalm 51, verse 8, it says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. You know, when you think about discipline, it, it works like that, doesn't it? It doesn't feel good, and we don't like it, and sometimes it hurts. But the reality is that discipline isn't for the moment. Discipline is for the long haul. Discipline is provided in our lives by people and by a God who loves us so that in the long term we will be able to rejoice and be able to enjoy life. You know, some of you have said and some of you have heard a parent say, I'm doing this for your good, right? Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah, that's what it's all about, that God disciplines those he loves. You know, the second way that God deals with us out of his unfailing love is something called mercy. Now, we use the word mercy a lot, right? I want to I sort of give you a practical definition that will help you understand what mercy looks like. Let's say that you are, you are driving down the street and you realize that you are late for a meeting. It's an important meeting and you've got to get there. And so you press down the accelerator and you're going fast. In fact, to your dismay, you see red lights flashing and you look down at the speedometer and you're going 80 miles an hour in a 60 mile per hour zone. The officer comes up to the side of the car and says, what's the rush? And you say, officer, I'm late for a meeting. I, I was speeding. I didn't know how fast I was going, but you know what? Do what you got to do. The officer goes back to his car. He checks out your information. Comes back up to the window. Hands you a warning citation and says, slow down. That, dear friends, is mercy. Mercy is when you and I do not receive what we deserve. It's when we deserve some kind of punishment and we get off. That's mercy. And the reality of the whole idea of mercy is that David pleads with God. He says, God, according to your unfailing love, blot out my transgression. Don't, don't let me experience the consequence of what I deserve. Show me mercy. That's what God does for us. Because God doesn't punish us in anger. God disciplines us in love. And he shows us mercy instead of giving us what we deserve. Now, we've got to go a little deeper, though. Because the unfailing love part deals with the surface level. We've got to go deeper. And to do that, we've got to understand the nature of our sin. So let's, let's go on just a little further. David says, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I don't know if you, if you caught it, but there are two things that, that David describes about our sin and our, our struggle with sin that we need to get clear in order to understand what's happening. Number one, he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil. 
One aspect of the sin that we deal with are the things that we do, right? It's our actions and our attitude. It's the things that we think about. It's the things we're conscious about. It's the things we consciously do or the things we consciously do not do. It's the actions that we have. But our problem is that our sin goes deeper than that. Much deeper. It goes beyond our thoughts and it goes beyond our actions and it goes beyond our attitudes. It goes to our very nature. That's where David said, Surely I was sinful at birth. Conceived sinful. Do you realize that our problem with sin isn't just about words and actions and attitudes? Our problem with sin is that we have a nature that is already sinful. It's inherited from our parents and from their parents and from their parents and from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, it stained their nature and they have passed that on to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren all the way down to us. And so our struggle isn't just with what we do, it is our very nature. So for our God who wants to, to help us, our God who wants to see us through this sin problem, he's got to go deeper. You know, it kind of makes me think of our mission trip. And again, I don't want to show all the pictures or steal all the stories, but I do want to tell you a couple more stories. But one of the interesting things about this mission trip is that we go to Moore, Oklahoma, and we go to this community that has all kinds of needs. And part of what we do is to address real physical needs. So you see kids working in buildings. You see them trimming trees. One of the really cool things that they did is that they, they, gave, they put on a picnic for the community. At this picnic on the very last night, they, they were serving food and people were eating and eating and eating. It, honestly, it was as if they'd never had a meal like this. It was hot dogs and hamburgers. They said one man came up and, and got a plateful when he realized that there was more food, he got another plateful. When he realized there was still more food, he came and got a third giant plateful. And he had the biggest smile on his face because it seemed as if he hadn't eaten in a long time. One young man came up and, and got a huge plate of food. He got seconds and then he came up to one of the adult leaders and said, would it be okay if I made a plate to take home from my, to my mom? She couldn't come. So he made that plate and took it home. Isn't this a cute picture of a little girl with a treasure, a hot dog? You know, it's a precious thing to be able to meet these physical needs and to know that in that moment, we're blessing these lives. They're, they're getting food. We're making their homes more secure. We're making their surroundings more delightful and safer. But you understand, dear friends, if that's as far as we go, we're not leaving anything of eternal value. That's just social ministry. And so the beauty is that this mission trip goes far beyond that. It doesn't just deal with the superficial physical needs. They're important, and they address them with sincerity and with real conviction, but they go deeper to address their spiritual needs. That's the result are pictures like this. Two of our young people praying with someone. This one is a great picture. The next one, please. Where one of our, one of our students is handing, describing, telling the story of the gospel and handing this gospel card with a little bracelet that tells the whole story of Jesus' love. And this girl is telling her about God's love for her. Explaining that we're there serving that community because of God's love for us and the desperate need for them to know God's love for them. I think we've got one more. It's one of our team. They're prayer walking. As they go along the street with adult supervision, of course, they're going along, and when they encounter people, they, they visit with them, they, they greet them, they're kind and polite. They may give them one of the, the salvation bracelets or the salvation card, and in the process they say, is there anything we can pray for? Because, you see, the goal isn't just to meet those physical needs is to provide the Holy Spirit that, that witness that we're called to give so that he can work the power of eternal life in their hearts and souls. Do you understand that when it comes to our guilt, 
God realizes that, that just blotting out our transgressions, that just making us feel better, that that's not the solution. That's just the, the surface level issue. That the real issue goes to our very nature, that we are in bondage, that we are chained to that old sinful nature and it clings to us and it holds us in its grip until something breaks us free. And what breaks us free is the power of the gospel. That God in his mercy sends his son to redeem us. You can hear, you can hear that need expressed by David. As he says, surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place, beyond my thoughts and beyond my mind. You go to the very nature of who I am. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. That God doesn't just deal with the surface. God brings healing and hope and freedom from guilt all the way to our nature through the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. So the last thing I want to mention to you, that's how God deals with our guilt. I want to talk to you about three ways that we can deal with our guilt. Because it's not just about how God does, it's about what we do from here. And so number one, one of the ways that we deal with guilt is that we bury it. We try like David to just shove it down, to pretend it's not there, to hide it, to cover it up, to tell more lies, to do whatever is required, to stuff it away. But dear friends, the reality is it always comes up again. Buried things don't stay hidden. Eventually they're revealed. And that's the truth of our lives as it comes to God in our lives. It comes to guilt in our lives. It always comes back again. God doesn't want us to deal with our guilt by just burying it. Second way that we deal with it is that we transfer it. You know, we push it off on somebody else. Anybody remember Flip Wilson? Okay, the 8 o'clock service, everybody did. 9.30 service, a few of us do. 11 o'clock, there might be one or two, right? Flip Wilson is, a, is an entertainer from years ago. He was a famous entertainer, had a show, and one of the things he was famous for was saying what? The devil made me do it. Yeah, we can transfer our guilt. We can say it's somebody else's fault. We can say that it's their problem. We can say that, that uh, you know, she did it, or she started me, or she launched me, or, or he invited me, or he set the pattern, or everybody's doing it. We can transfer our guilt in all kinds of ways. We can mourn our guilt. We can walk around in a pity party. We can let it eat away and chew away and terrorize our lives. It can cause us to be miserable for the rest of our days. None of those work. Except when it comes to transferring guilt, there is one option. It's not to our friends, it's not to our siblings, it's not to our family, it's not to our culture, it's not to the devil. It's to Jesus. That when we transfer our guilt to Jesus, that's where there is hope. Because that's what the message of the cross is all about. That as Jesus hung on the cross, as he cried out those words, Father, why have you forsaken me? The reality is that Jesus was forsaken because he was carrying your guilt and my guilt, your shame and my shame. He was carrying the entirety of our sin on his shoulders. And what God gives to Jesus is the punishment for us that we deserve and in its place he sets us free. He doesn't just forgive us. He sets us free. You know, sort of like uh, jury duty. How many have endured jury duty? One of the great solutions to jury duty, even if you get picked to be part of the jury, is that they will come in at the last minute and say, the case has been settled out of court, you are free to go, right? That's precisely what God does. Instead of you going and standing before the judgment throne, instead of you and I facing the reality of the charges against us, the guilt and the shame of our sin and the consequences we deserve, God settles this out of court by sending his son to bear our sin, to wash us clean. Romans 8 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? That's you. You are the ones that God has chosen and all who believe in his son. 
Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justified. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. No one condemns. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and so is also interceding for us. One more VBS story. Some of you may have seen this on Facebook. So the, the first day, they just had a handful of kids. And then as the week went on, more and more and more kids came. At the end of the very first day, a little boy was riding his bike by, and he saw this activity, and so he turned in, and he, he came by, and he sat down. And as he was there the next day, you could see that, that God was working in his life. And, and before long, this little boy, Timmy is his name, Timmy leaned over to one of the college students that was working with him, and he said, you know, I'm going to stop cussing. I don't think it's right anymore. That's a cool thing, isn't it? To think that God is working in his heart. They weren't talking about cussing. But God was working in his heart and he was, he was convicting him. He was disciplining of that, of that guilt, through that guilt and shame and bringing him to a place of humility. And so the little boy said, I'm not going to cuss anymore. Well, one of the interesting things is that they asked this little boy to pray. I want you to just get a, a glimpse of this little guy. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, the part that they didn't catch that's really, really powerful is that at the beginning of the week when these little kids would lead the echo prayer, they would talk about Jesus, their friend. See, they could understand friends. They could understand people that were with them and people that cared about them and people that loved them and people that were on their side. But one of the adult leaders said to me, the most powerful thing of the whole week was for me was when at the end of the week, instead of praying to Jesus, their friend, they were praying to Jesus, their Savior. Brothers and sisters, that's the entire difference. That instead of having a Jesus who is our friend, we have a Jesus who has saved us. No matter what the guilt you're carrying, no matter how deeply you are flawed, no matter what mistakes you've made, the reality is you have not just a friend, you have a Savior who blots out your transgression, who dives deep into your soul to change your very nature and set you free. And so instead of walking out here burdened and buried by guilt, walk out of here in the freedom of the cross of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your mercy and for your discipline and for your great compassion. Lord, cleanse us and we will be clean. Wash us and we will be whiter than snow through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you share this message of hope. Amen.